Hello. Well, welcome to the Zoom room, uh, Dr. D'Amico. It's wonderful to have you here. I feel like we've been talking about this meeting for a long time. <laughs> um, Absolutely. I'm super excited and, to be here. Yeah, no, we're, we're thankful to have you. As you may know, this is our fourth uh, educational Zoom session now with you guys over at Lenox Hill. We so appreciate you taking the time to meet with us and teach us a lot about neurosurgery and what you do and all the things that we should know. So um, as you know, I'm Angel. I'm the founder of uh, Brain Tumor Companion and Meningioma Companion, which is a peer-to-peer -peer platform for uh, patients, caregivers, and support people at all stages of this diagnosis. So um, I've been doing this now for two years, and my goal, obviously, is to bring education and resources to people who are on this journey. So um, I'll let you introduce you yourself, who you are, and what you're doing over there at Lenox Hill, and kind of uh, take it where you want to take it today. We're excited to learn from you. Oh, great. Thanks so much, Angel. Um, yeah, it's a, a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the invite. I know you guys have spoken with a few of our other surgeons. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, uh, we can kind of round out what really is comprehensive care for patients with, you know, meningiomas. It's, it's more than just removal of a tumor. It affects your whole life. And so, uh, you know, I'm an assistant professor of neurosurgery here at Lenox Hill. I've been here now about three years. Um, I came from Columbia. Actually, Taylor was at Columbia with me. She's my nurse practitioner. And, um, so we know each other for a long time now. And, um, you know, Lenox Hill in Northwell is a, a tremendous place. It's really like a family and a home. Um, and we, you know, like to think that we invite our, our patients into that family and that home. And so uh, in the three years I've been here, um, I'm a brain tumor specialist. I also specialize in spine tumors, uh, specialize in spine tumors. And um, I came in and I kind of, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it in the talk, um, but, you know, started a program for brain and spine metastases because there was no one really focusing on that. And so metastases, I'm sure you guys are aware, has to do more with when patients have a cancer in their body that travels to the brain. Um, and so while that's kind of my primary clinical focus right now, uh, I'm still a brain tumor surgeon. And so I do kind of everything, um, anything that involves oncology. That's just kind of where, you know, it's, it's easier to tackle a big problem if you have different people siloed in different regions of it. So I'm kind of under the silo of that. And that's kind of my task to make that program a reality and a success, um, but we all kind of embark on, on our different journeys. So, you know, if you're okay with that, I'm going to share my screen. Is that all right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I love it. And I see, um, is everyone here on the West Coast? No, no we're on the East Coast, except Angel. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. And Lisa and, and Brenda. Oh, and Brenda, right. Yeah. And, Brenda. and Lisa, that's we're right. West Coasters and the others are East Coasters. Well, good morning to the West Coasters, and good yeah. afternoon to the East Coasters. Um, which screen are you guys seeing? Are you seeing the presentation mode or are you seeing the presenter view? Both. Both. Oh, you're, yeah. You're seeing both. All right, hold on one yeah. second. I can fix that. How about now? Both. Oh, the, the presentation. Presentation and just, just the little blocks on the side. Yeah, it's the full okay. presentation. Yeah. Good, perfect. Now it should be full screen. All right, perfect. excellent. Yeah, so, you know, I titled this, it, it'll be brief. I want to entertain more than anything questions because I think the interactive nature of these things is actually the most useful. Um, but I put, you know, meningioma benign disease with a question mark, right? Because that's what probably everyone who's had one has been told, right? Oh, this is a benign disease. Um, but that's, you know, a bit of a misnomer, right? Number one, um, the treatment for this is still surgery and surgery is not in and of itself benign, all right? And then number two, as everyone knows, you know, there's grades of this. There are shades of meningiomas, and some of them are very aggressive. Um, and so all of a sudden, that benign disease, what it means by that is that this is not a cancer, but it can be locally very aggressive and very disabling. Um, and so, you know, I think it's it's important to, to understand that we understand that, all right? You're not dealing with, you know, someone who's going to shrug off your condition and say, oh, no, you've got a benign disease. Don't, you know, you don't have to worry about this. Um we talked a little bit about who I am. So, um, like I said, I trained at Columbia. I went to medical school um, at Rutgers, actually, before going to Columbia. Training at Columbia is, you know, seven years. I did a fellowship here at Lenox Hill. I stayed on on service um, and staff here. And you might know us from the previous guys talking, but also, obviously, from Netflix, um, which, if you haven't watched, I would encourage you to. I'm not in it. You can see my left arm in one episode, so it's not a plug <laughs> for me. Um, they say I have a face for radio. And so... <laughs> 
I didn't quite make the cut. Um, but anyway, it's it's pretty uh, it's a pretty powerful series, and it happened kind of just as COVID started. And I think you know it, it's a really interesting kind of segue into that period of our our, our lives. Um, I talked about this briefly already. This is a program that I started really in August. So what it means really, and for you guys to understand, is that um, you know we were treating brain metastases before I came on board. All right. Uh, and they were doing a great job of it. John Bookbar was here for a long time before I was Dave Langer, Jason Ellis. These guys were all here. Um, but we decided as Northwell kind of embraces the cancer community and says, you know, we can do better. We have a huge footprint here in New York. There's a massive population of cancer patients. We have all these resources. Let's make care better. Um, I talked to, you know, John, who really runs the glioma work here. And I said, John, you know, let me focus on this. That way you take it off your plate. I can be the guy who just kind of helps organize this. Um, and much to my surprise, he said, okay. <laughs> so he let me kind of run with it. And since then, you know, we have a radiation oncologist, a, a medical oncologist who works with me. Taylor obviously is on board. We've got physical therapists, nutritionists, um, social workers, palliative care experts. We've got this enormous team of people now kind of under this umbrella. And what we've done is look at the entire journey of a brain tumor patient and find intervention points along the way where we can now take your care and take it to that next level and prove to you that you've, you know, not just a team, but a whole family um, caring about this entire journey. Because, you know, I, I, I've said this before, um, and again, meningium is no difference. A brain tumor is not a sniper shot, right? It doesn't affect one person. It's a grenade. You're, you're taking your whole family, everyone around you on the ride with this. And so I think having a big group of people who can help take care of you um, gives you that support network and just amplifies it, right? Uh, and importantly, with experts, right? Because we don't always have, our family members are not always experts. Um, and so meningioma, you guys are all aware, um, I imagine. Is, you know, I, I have to ask, I don't, if you don't want to answer, go for it. Does everyone here have a meningioma or does anyone, has anyone, does everyone have a family member with one? We're all patient. I've had one. You've had one. Okay, good. Yeah, we're all... Not good, but good. I now yeah. I understand the framework. Yeah. We're, all right. yeah, we're all patients on this call. We're all yeah. post-craniotomy, actually. And, um, yeah. Amazing. Well, this you all look wonderful. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, meningiomas are the most common uh, primary brain tumor, right? And we say it's benign. But again, about 40% of, if you look at every tumor that we see over the course of a year, about 40% are going to be meningiomas. And what's interesting about that is that they arise anywhere, anywhere where there is dura, because they come from the cells in the dura, these arachnoid cap cells, they can arise. And more and more work is looking into that. It turns out that they are actually subtly different when you look at the genetics. Different, gen, you know, genetically different tumors arise more commonly in unique locations. Um, and those locations share actually the genomic profile compared to other ones. And that just is important as we decide, you know, as we move forward in terms of treatment, are there certain places where we need to change our treatment plans, right, based on the genetics of these tumors? Um, there are three grades, right? Grade one is a curable lesion, depending on the location, okay? Um, meaning that if it's on the skull top here or anywhere away from the major veins, you can remove this totally as well as the surrounding tissue it arose from, and you can deliver a cure. Um, grade, it, now a grade one lesion that arises in a more complex lesion is a different story, right? If it's in the major veins in your brain, you cannot really take those out, all right? And so that disease gets left behind. And that leads us into the realm of kind of radio surgery, which we'll talk about a little bit. If it's at the skull base or involving the bone of your skull, can be very difficult to get these out, even if it is still a grade one lesion. And so, you know, as, as our surgical approaches have gotten better, we try, but it's not always feasible. And so again, curable for the select bunch, right? Grade twos and threes. Um, well, let's start with grade three, actually. I'm gonna skip grade two for a minute. Grade three is aggressive, okay? Grade three almost always comes back. A grade three can come back in different places, all right? It's a very difficult disease. Again, locally aggressive, okay? Grade twos are a wild card. Some grade twos act more like grade ones and some grade twos act more like grade threes. And so our grade twos are in the middle and you can see here this five-year survival rate. This is for the twos and threes, 78% for the twos and 44% for the threes. Now, anytime you look at a survival rate, remember this is aggregate data over the past, 
Okay, it's not looking forward. So I, I, I like presenting these numbers for perspective, but these numbers are not truths. These numbers are, you know, historical representations. And as we know more about things, these numbers can change, okay? And the other thing is everyone's tumor is different, all right? And so everyone's story in this whole thing is different. So the presentation is variable. And, I, you know, everyone, I'm sure you guys all have a different story here, um, but it's just like Manhattan real estate. Location is everything, right? So if it ends up right between your optic nerves, it can be a very small tumor with very serious effects, such as blindness. If it ends up on the front of your brain, you know, here, it can grow to a very large size before it ever causes a problem, okay? In the spinal uh, column, which is the image on the left there, um, they can be very small and wreak a lot of havoc because there's not a lot of space in that location, okay? So it has to do with where the cranial nerves are, where the critical vascular structures of your brain are, okay? Um, and then the general location of where the meningioma arises, all right? And that's an important concept because it also weighs into the, the kind of how easy they are to remove, all right? Diagnosis, um, CAT scans, MRI, you know, biopsy, ultimately surgery still plays a very large role in meningiomas. Um, and then Dota PET scans, we'll talk a little bit about this later on in terms of a, a kind of a newer imaging modality that we use here. So treatment, I just alluded to it. It's really primarily surgery and radiation, all right? Um, you attempt what's called a Simpson grade resection, um, which is kind of an antiquated idea discussing not just removal of your tumor, but removal of those cells around the tumor, the dura, the lining of the brain, all right? Um, and in some places that's not possible, all right? And it turns out that we probably have to rethink that, especially for skull-based lesions, lesions at the bottom of the brain. Um, this idea of a Simpson grade resection is probably not that important. But then radiation is super important, right? Um, we have stereotactic radio surgery. We have large field, what's called external beam fractionated, where you get it a few times. And um, our treatment with stereotactic is very good, uh, or of efficacy, I would say. In terms of external beam, it's variable, but usually pretty good. Um, again, location is probably the primary determinant here. And then the tumor itself, you know, what kind of tumor you're dealing with. So what do we do? All right, what are the advances in the surgical management since surgery still plays a large role in the treatment of this? And so, you know, neuronavigation, I'm, I'm assuming that everyone here had a surgery with some sort of navigation guidance, right? That's pretty much standard of care now in neurosurgery, but it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable, right? It's a GPS system for your brain. We can get within millimeter accuracy. We can make our surgeries smaller. We can avoid areas in advance, kind of know where the important critical areas are and see what we need to see. Um, and we can do that before we ever even touch your skin, right? So it's, it's pretty remarkable. Neuroplastic surgery, I think Dr. Ben Shalom had presented to you guys previously. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. It's, it's, um, I think meningioma surgery is probably one of the most important parts or, or components of neuroplastics. Um, and some of you may or may not have gone through this, but, a, but meningiomas can go through the dura into the bone and you're left with a defect. Um, and that can be cosmetic. It can be disfiguring. Um, it can even just appear disfiguring. And with neuroplastic techniques, this kind of modern approach to thinking about neurosurgery using plastic surgery techniques, um, we can facilitate a reconstruction that really, you know, helps you live, you know, a normal life, you know, without the kind of hindrance of this, okay? Um, fluorescence guidance is a very newer thing, okay? This has actually not been fully validated. I'm part of a large study looking at this now. But um, there's a fluorophore, meaning a, a, a drug that we can give that makes the tumor glow in the dark, all right? And, you know, some percentage of meningiomas will actually, um, you know, metabolize this and make it glow in the dark. And we're still looking at the utility of this. Now, the reason I say that is that in general, meningiomas do not invade the brain. Grade threes can, but in general, there is a plane. You can separate your tumor from the brain and so if you can see that separation, then you don't need fluorescence. You can see it physically with your eyes. However, um, and some of you might have dealt with this, sometimes there's microscopic disease and the fluorescence, if it works or if we can even make it better, we can go further with our resection. We can take that little bit of residual out, which we know in a meningioma is gonna make you do better, all right? So this is something that's very, very um, cool. It's very forthcoming. I used it on a case recently that I thought it was um, absolutely necessary. And it was a tumor that was eroding from the skull base into the area um, called the maxilla here behind your jaw. 
And I was able to go through the top of the skull into this area and had fluorescence guide me so that I could find the tumor boundaries in an area that I, I normally can't get to. And so, I, again, I think it's proven itself to me in certain cases. And so I'm looking forward to see what the data shows on it. And then connectomics is a little bit different. Really, again, certain tumor types, this becomes important. And I'll explain a little bit about what it is. And so neuroplastics, we talked about a little bit. This is this idea of blending neurosurgical techniques and plastic surgery, and then this reconstruction, right? When you have involvement of your bone, we need to take that bone out. This tumor can grow back from the bone, right? And I have a very difficult case of this right now where the tumor in the brain is gone, but the bony disease has gotten really bad. And, um, you know, we're, we're left with not a lot of options here, but with neuroplastic techniques, we're given a few more. And we can create custom-made 3D implants that reconstruct your skull. No longer is it a flat piece of mesh that's not, you know, bent the right way. And so you've got this weird contour to your head in one place or the mesh kind of arose to your skin. Now it's actually taking the other side of your head and making the other side look just like it, you know? So, um, you know, we consider this, you know, I, I consider this a major advance. I consider meningioma surgery to be a place where this has extreme utility, all right? Fluorescence I just told you about. This is a picture of what it looks like when it fluoresces. So a little bit yucky looking, and I apologize. It's early in the morning on the West Coast, but <laughs> it's um, the main thing to look at is the color, right? And so it glows this red pinkish color. And, um, and actually, these are microscope pictures. I actually use something called an exoscope. And um, the brightness of the exoscope is, is much more robust. And so you can see this really, really clearly. But you can see how in, an, in a picture like this one in the middle, can you guys see my mouse here? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's wow. not totally clear that that's tumor, but all of a sudden it's glowing, right? Mm -hmm. And so you get a little more information. This bony involvement here, very robustly glowing, right? So you can trim this down, remove it. You can take it to the bony edge where there is no more tumor, right? Clearly. Yeah. And so I think that in the cases that this will help, I think it will be a big help. Um, it won't be every case, but I think it will be a big help. Uh, I didn't mention this in our list, but this is actually pretty incredible. This is, um, you guys probably don't remember it, but when you're in the operating room, you take a small biopsy, it's called a frozen section. And you send it to pathology and you sit there for about 20 minutes and then they read, they, they analyze the tissue and they say, that's, that's the tumor, that's not the tumor, right? And when you're looking for margins, Every time you send a margin, you're waiting for 20 minutes, right? And the OR utilization time goes up and you're just sitting there and nothing's happening. And, you know, uh, it can be a waste of time. And what this is, is a machine that uses a, a technology called Raman uh, histology, Raman spectroscopy. And it creates a virtual image that looks just like the pathologist slide. And it does it in two minutes. Um, which and it sits in the operating room. So all of a sudden, when you're looking for margins, you have the answer right there in front of you. And uh, to further blow your mind, it's actually got it's got artificial intelligence capabilities, and it's not FDA approved yet. But I've played with it, where the machine itself will tell you the likelihood that there is tumor present or not. So you don't have to wait for the pathologist at all to wow, come back that's and call you. That yeah, is so cool. <laughs> super yeah. cool. So just by <laughs> looking. Just by looking at the squiggly lines and everything and looking at a huge data set of these images, the computer itself can, can say 80% meningioma, 20%, you know, normal tissue kind of thing. Give you a percentage. And pretty remarkable. Um, wow. That is amazing. Cool. <laughs> and then connectomics. This is kind of, this is my baby. This is something I'm very interested in. Um, this is based on work that was called the Human Connectome Project. It happened in the early 2000s. There was a big push to better understand the functional networks of the brain, all right? And your brain, um, believe it or not, no matter what anyone tells you, it's all important, okay? Um, and different regions talk to different regions. So it's not just that little area where your tumor is pushing on that's important. It's interaction with other areas that all work together to perform a function, a task that makes you human, right? That is what's important. And so we are able now with modern MRI techniques to look at those functional networks. Um, and not a lot of places are doing this right now. I've been using it now for a few months and I, I can't do a brain, a brain tumor without it anymore. I find it to be totally fascinating. And you're able to say, we're near the language area. Where exactly is the language area relative to the tumor? What's it communicating with? 
let's say it's a recurrent tumor where all bets are off, right? The plane now between the brain and the tumor no longer exists as nicely. So you're going to be doing a component of brain surgery here. You're going to be influencing the brain. You want to know where you are and what's affected. And the reason you want to know that is to design how you do your surgery, but it's also the counsel of the patient, you guys, and say, this is what's really at risk, all right? And not just blanket stuff like, oh, you may have a stroke. No, no, no. You may have difficulty focusing. You may have difficulty with imagination. You may have difficulty performing tasks that are a little bit complex, like paying your bills or, you know, or speaking, things like that. And so, you know, we need a lot more information on this. Um, we're actually hoping to start a, a big study here uh, using it and contributing to another kind of multi-institutional study about it. But truly, truly remarkable technology. And, and it's the future of how we do brain surgery. All of these things kind of put together. Um, gamma tile therapy. This is, uh, this is something called brachytherapy. Has anyone ever heard of brachytherapy? No. Nope. Brachytherapy no. is implantable radiation. So... Wow. You know, I, I, any of you have received radiation, you recover from your surgery, you know, sometime two, four weeks, maybe six weeks, depending on the pathology, maybe a few months, you have to go and get seen and get your radiation plan. And then you go for a few days, you do, they deliver the radiation, you go home. With Gamatol, you actually, in the operating room at the time of your surgery, lay down these small little tiles that have radiation seeds in it. And it delivers radiation to a very high dose to a very small, um, you know, distance. And mm. it's really primarily used in recurrent brain metastases. Um, and people are starting to use it in gliomas. But there are a lot of stories out there about people with very high grade um, meningiomas. that You know that there is lining in the dura or you know that there's lining on the skull base or maybe that's extended into the face where you can get a good resection and line these tiles in the cavity. Now, what's amazing about that is that radiation treatment starts the minute the tile's in your head. And so you go home and you're being treated with your radiation and it lasts for about a month probably in the wow. head. And so, you know, a, a really nice technique. Gamma Tile is a company brand. There's another one called Isoray. Um, they're covered by insurance. They're really, you know, I think expanding in utilization and we're going to find more and more ways to use this. And so you can see these are, what I just described to you is actually just the surgical end of things, right? Um, we haven't even got to the other components really. This is a little bit of radiation, but, and so what's our goal? Our goal is this, right? Our goal is to take what can be sometimes a massive, massive tumor um, and take the whole thing out and allow the person, you know, to be treated, you know, and return to their quality of life, right? And so, you know, this is, this is a patient of mine. I actually should have put up, I don't, I have a recent scan. His brain, this cavity has shrunk down to almost nothing. He's doing amazing. Mm -hmm. Um and it's a, you know, it's a grade uh, two lesion. So he got radiation. He's got actually, you can't tell in this image, but he's got one of these sonolucent implants. So he's got a clear plastic implant here because of bony involvement. Um, and we used fluorescence on him to see that. You can see a little bit of it here where it's yeah. extending into the bone. And yeah. so, you know, it's a, um, you know, this is kind of pulling all of that data together and, and getting it all in one place. And so um, the future, I think of this is it's very, very bright. All right. But then you have your surgery, you go home and you need to be monitored, right? And so this is that PET scan that I was telling you about. So in addition to our MRIs, um, we've established this dotatate PET, gallium dotatate. And this has to do with a, a certain receptor that grows on a, on a lot of meningiomas, most meningiomas called somatostatin. And I'm going to talk about this, this dotatate PET study for two reasons, all right? Number one is you can see looking at the MRI here, little figure A, um, yeah, there's there's tumor there, and you can see there's some bony involvement, but the metabolism here in C, you can see is a lot more clean, a lot more robust. You can see much more clearly kind of where things are. And what's interesting about this is that there are drugs that can target this receptor. There's a drug called Lutathera, and this study allows us to see if there's non-focal disease, so especially in the high grade. So maybe there's tumor here, but maybe there's also some tumor on the, on the meninges here, right? So you get a better sense of the extent of the disease burden, and then you can actually target it with a drug um, based on this, and then watch that as it kind of changes over time. And so this is still in clinical trial. Um, it's not approved yet for this, but the results are, are pretty fascinating, pretty interesting. I would tell you this, this is my, my interpretation of the results. If it's gonna work, it works. <laughs> If it's not going to work, it doesn't work. So <laughs> that's, that's kind of the way to think about it, right? 
Um, yeah. And then our medical management. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there who have recurrent disease and the surgeons become at a loss and the radiation didn't work and it's coming back. And so what medical options do you have? And the truth is, is not many. All right. It's been very, very difficult to find medications that work for this disease. And part of that is because it's, it's a, you know, a resilient, aggressive disease. And the other reason is that sometimes studying this disease can be hard because it's usually a very slow burn, right? And so you have to follow patients for many, many years in order to get results. And from a financial standpoint, that doesn't make a lot of sense to companies who want to get their drug approved very, very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the political you know, downside to all of this, but it's interesting nonetheless. All this tiny print is unreadable. Um, and that's not the point of that. I don't want you guys to squint. The reason I put it here is to show you, though, that there are studies, all right? There are drugs being looked at. There are a lot of drugs being looked at. Um, and the results are variable. But again, reasons to have hope, okay? In general, these treatments are experimental. There's nothing approved for meningioma. Um, sometimes somatostatin as a drug can be, um, and some of the angiogenic inhibitors. But most of these are going to be used off-label, and especially the lutathera. It's, we consider it salvage therapy. Um, and the big issue is that the big cytotoxic agents, the, the big chemos, don't really work that much. Um, the anti-angiogenics, which is a different type, which means that they stop blood uh, vessel growth for the most part, they've shown some efficacy, but it's still, it's still a problem. All right? And this is where a lot of the research is dedicated. And an important research here has to do with what I started with in the beginning. It's the genetics of your tumor. And I say your tumor, right? Because that's the problem. It's your tumor. Every tumor is a little bit different. There are trends, and we try to find common trends, and that's where we aim the targets. But in general, everybody has different mutations, and therefore everyone has different targets. And so when you're getting treated for these, you want to make sure that your oncologist, that your surgeon are sending a molecular panel, are working this up for, you know, are there mutations or alterations that can be targeted with an off-label drug? Because that's where, you know, any, any success is going to come from. But the big studies so far have been a little bit disappointing, and that's, that's the truth. Um, the last thing I'm going to end with before I, I kind of talk to you guys a little bit more candidly is, um, you know, I'm sure you all agree, communication with your physician and your team is critical, right? And so one of the things that we do here, this was actually started by our chairman, Dave Langer, who I don't, have you guys met Dave Langer? Yes, we did. Yeah. He was our first Zoom, actually. Uh, so he probably talked about this a little bit already, but um, I won't belabor it. Basically, it's an app that he designed. He's kind of a brilliant guy. And it allows us to put into the into kind of a chat, almost like a social media content, um, images. We get to talk directly to you, go over your film. So you always have this available to you. You can show your family members just on your phone, right? We can share it with your doctors. We can share it with your nurses, right? And it becomes this kind of like, you know, it's online multimedia content where we can elevate not just the communication with you, but your education as well, right? Because now you can see physically the representation of your tumor in your head and you can hear your doctor explaining your reasons and you can revisit it you know, 10, 20, 30 infinite times, right? And so this is something that I use on all my cancer patients. I think that a communication platform like this for any sort of oncology, surgical neuro-oncology patient is absolutely critical. Um, and this is, uh, we've been piloting it here, obviously, for the past few years, and, and we're going to keep piloting it and expand it into the brain and spine METS program as well. And so that's kind of my, my initial kind of overhaul um, I think it's exciting uh, to think about these things. I think the, the trajectory of technology um, in neurosurgery is always absolutely incredible. Um, and, you know, a lot of times it's like, you know, you already, you've already been through this. Like, why didn't that exist? Why didn't that exist? Um, mm -hmm. But I think the fact that you guys are even on this call is a commitment to making sure the next generation of people who have to deal with this, um, you know, are, are educated, right, and supported. And so these are things you can always talk about with people and, and let them know what's going on. Um, one of the questions that was in the, uh, that was posed to me, which I think is a really important question, is people wanted to know, how do you choose someone? How do you choose a surgical neuro-oncologist? And regardless if it's a meningioma, uh, a glioma, whether it's a, you know, a, a, another type of benign tumor, a pituitary adenoma, something like that. And, you know, this is a tough question. We deal with this a lot. I live, uh, I'm in Manhattan, obviously. We're a 14 mile by two mile island, right? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> there are five major academic centers on this island, right? Mm -hmm. So every patient who walks in my door is basically like, well, why am I coming to you? How do I know who to go to? Um, and so, you know, you get, you, you, you deal with this, unfortunately, constantly. What I would say is, you know, the, the internet is your friend and your enemy. Um, you know, there are different, every patient is different and every patient's situation is different. Not everyone can travel away from their town. Not everyone can travel to, you know, the Mayo Clinic or Lenox Hill Neurosurgery or UCSF or, or these major academic centers. And so if there's, there's pretty much a, a, um, an appropriate academic center in every city and every state of this country, right? You want to make sure that it's convenient for you because you're going to need you know, treatment, you're going to need a surgery, you're going to need follow-up, you're going to need to make sure your family is okay with this. Um, and so you're going to go to Google, right? Google's um, amazing and it's scary, right? There are lots of ads. So the per when you Google best meningioma surgeon, what comes up are ads paid for by hospitals uh, for the best surgeons, not necessarily the best surgeons, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're going to spend some time, you have to spend some time on the websites. You have to look at who your surgeon, who's being presented to you, who was consulted on your case, right? Um, and you need to look at how they present themselves, all right? So on their website, does it say that they're a brain tumor specialist? It doesn't say that they do lots of, you know, spine surgery for back pain, but they also do meningiomas, right? That's a very different thing, right? It doesn't make them an expert necessarily in one thing. You want someone who is passionate about their 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 thing, right? Because what the studies have shown is when you go to someone who does this regularly, when you go to a system that deals with this regularly, that your care is going to be better. You're going to have more options. Your outcome is going to be better. And it's it's an old adage, but practice makes perfect, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're going to people who have, are high volume centers, you're gonna it, it's it's been proven, and you can have a fantastic surgeon. Um, and so I would always say that you know your your personality mix with your surgeon has to be there as well, right? So you can go to a major academic center and not mesh with the person at all, and that's mm -hmm. not going to go well for anyone, right? So you always got to be savvy about that. But um, I think, you know, looking at the website, seeing how they sell themselves, all right, seeing what it is. Now, listen, if you go to my website right now, it says I'm the director of the Brain and Spine Metastasis Program. Does that mean I don't know about meningiomas? Not necessarily, right? And so in that case, then you talk to your, you talk to your surgeon and you say, listen, you know, it doesn't say that you do this. Do you do this? And let them explain to you. Um, I think that most surgeons are scared into being as honest as humanly possible by the potential for bad outcomes, right? Outcomes are our currency. If we don't have good outcomes, we don't get more patients, right? Doctors are very savvy about this and they stop referring. And so, um, you know, we are scared into telling you exactly what we think a lot of times, all right? And if you don't feel like someone's being honest with you, you go somewhere else, all right? You want that honest opinion. Um, fortunately for meningioma patients, in general, there is time before you need surgery, all right? And so you have the opportunity to get more than one opinion. And I think that's super important, always. Um, and then you wanna ask the person and say, well, you know, what is your institution doing to advance this care, right? So after I have my surgery, what is your institution gonna be able to offer me um, in terms of dealing with something that may come back? Are there clinical trials, right? Clinical trials are so important to moving medicine forward. And it's scary, right? Everyone's like, well, I don't want to be experimented on. Um, but, you know, there's more education. you got to find out what the trial is and what, you know, are you being experimented on or is it something very reasonable? Are there no other options for you? You know, these are all very real things. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, location is a big factor. Personality is a big factor. At the end of the day, for any sort of brain, brain lesion, spinal cord lesion, you need to be at a major academic center. You need to be at a place where they're looking at research because then they're not just looking at you as a patient that's going to pay the bills. They're looking at you as, as information to help treat medical problems in the future, right? Um, so they're going to take care of you. They're going to care about your outcome because them doing a good job changes the way medicine globally is practiced, right? And so that's a, that's a, big, a big factor without a doubt. Nice. Thank you so much. That was... A lot of information. Sorry. Uh, my mind is blown. I don't know if everyone else yeah. is just like, that was, I'm still, I'm still in the fluorescent thing going, wow, that is so cool. <laughs> well, listen, we got time. I don't, I don't know if you guys have time. Go ahead. 
No, I said, can you repeat all that? <laughs> <laughs> it's recorded. No, it's, it's recorded. And for that reason, so we can actually register even more of it later. You know, um, I appreciate you kind of wrapping that up wow. with the importance of finding the right neurosurgeon. We talk about this a lot in our peer-to-peer -peer Zoom groups. Um, a lot of people get really stuck on their first diagnosis with the first doctor they meet. And I really advocate for getting second and third opinions because what one neurosurgeon won't touch, another one will. And, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, it's not operable. My surgeon says, you know, I just have to live with this. And it's like, well, maybe you need to meet a few more surgeons, people who, like you say, do this every day and yeah. have a different skill set and have access to more tools within their toolbox at maybe the universities and the institutions they work for. So um, it is real. I got four opinions. They all said the same thing. And I thought, OK, well, I guess I'm signing up for a craniotomy. Yeah. Um, so it is really very important. But yes, if you have more time, I'd love to go around the room, introduce a little bit of who we are and ask a question. So no, please, uh, if yeah. that works for you, uh, we will start off with Elizabeth from Florida. You have Hi, the Elizabeth. floor. You're muted, Elizabeth. Oh, oh yeah, you are muted. <laughs> See if we can get her on. If not, we will move on and come back. I don't think I can unmute you. <laughs> yeah, I know. If only I could. I the little microphone one. You. Okay. There we go. go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. So um, just a little bit about myself, although my question isn't related to myself. I have four mangiomas, and they were discovered about two and a half years ago. Um. I went to two different doctors, got two different opinions, and I finally settled with Mayo Clinic. Um, I had a craniotomy because what the major one they were concerned with was on the brainstem. And it was causing me balance issues and issues with my eyes and various things. With, and so they, I waited a while and finally the doctor said that it was large and it was pushing against the brainstem. Um, so the suggestion was surgery and I had surgery on it, but they could not remove it. It had seven of the 12 nerves enclosed in the mangioma. Yeah. So all they could basically do is try to reduce the size of it. So it wouldn't push so much on my brainstem. I lost my hearing in the, it was on the left side and I lost yeah. my hearing. I also gained trigenital neuralgia. Oh. And glass of pharyngeal neuralgia. Wow. After the surgery. And when I came back, I had to learn how to walk and do a few, a lot of things from the beginning. Um, just recently, one of mine, uh, well, I have one in the left optic nerve, one in the right optic nerve, one in the base of the skull also. The one in the right optic nerve was gaining size. So they did. Um, I, on the one on the brainstem, I had five sessions of gamma knife. Just yeah. recent, I had gamma knife on the one on the right optic nerve because it was starting to gain size. Um, and they're monitoring that because they said the only other choice would be surgery if they had to go in and do anything more with that one. And the other two on the left optic nerve and the base of the skull are wait and watch. Yeah. So at this point, I'm Elizabeth. just on a... Yeah. yeah, you've gone through it. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, uh, you know, that's incredible. Um, well, I'll tell you that the ones that are down by the brainstem like that involving the cranial nerves are incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult. Um, and the fact that you look like you can give me a smile um, is, <laughs> is remarkable, yeah. actually, you know, I think they did a great job. Um, despite the, you know, this, the, the kind of things that came along with it, which I'm sure are really, really hard to deal with because, um, trigeminal neuralgia, glossop neuro, these are no joke. This is, this is, these are big issues. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, hands down. I actually, I usually tell my patients in those situations, especially depending on the size, a hundred percent chance of a cranial nerve deficit because these tumors are involving these nerves and th these nerves, I, I mean, I'm not sure anyone's ever shown them to you. They're, um, like angel hair pasta or smaller, right? And they're in a they're in a a mass, you know, that is obscuring your vision. And sometimes they're right in the middle of it, and um, it's very difficult to preserve them and their function. 
Um, yeah, you've been through it, Elizabeth. I, my my hats off to you. You are you are a hero, without a doubt. That she is to so many of us. She inspires yeah. us all the time because she's just a champ, and she always does it with a smile, which is amazing. Um, I know you had a question uh, related to your son who also has brain tumors, Elizabeth. Yeah, this is my son has recently been diagnosed, excuse me, with um, um, melanoma brain tumors. And um, he had a craniotomy to reduce one. Um, they have him on um, chemo and they just finished doing gamma knife on the ones in the brain. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered what the outcome of patients that you know they have melanoma brain tumors and they do the gamma knife, what the typical outcome is for something like that. He also has nodules in his lung, his liver, and on his chest. Oh, wow. Do you know what chemo he's on? Is he on the immunotherapy? Yes. Is he on two agents? Um, yeah, I think he said there were two agents that he's on. Yeah, and he's yeah. Ipa, Ipamilulab and Nivolumab or something like that. It's Ipinibo yeah. is what we call it, yeah. So yeah. listen, um, melanoma, it's stage four melanoma, right? So at the, at the end of the day, it is a terminal disease because it's a cancer, okay? It's about time. And so we've gotten a lot better at this and the immunotherapies are incredible, Okay. Um, they will buy time without a doubt. And the combination immunotherapy, if that's what he's on, and again, I'm speaking here assuming, I don't know. Um, yeah. They've been shown to actually prevent further brain metastases, okay? Prevent, not stop, just prevent, okay? So there, there can be more and it's already stage four. Um, the radio surgery is incredibly good at controlling brain disease for metastases, okay? In general, it is very rare these days for patients to, to die from their brain metastases, okay? That is not usually the cause of death. It's usually a systemic problem, all right? Now, every case is different. I can't say that, I can't promise you that, all right? But the radio surgery in the short term is absolutely the way to go. And the combination therapy is a good sign. And so, you know, hopefully, you know, good quality of life and longevity here but that's Elizabeth. Uh, you've uh, you're you're a trooper, Elizabeth. You've got some stories, and I'm uh, you know, again, you were smiling before. I'm sorry to bring up <laughs> hard stuff, but you know, you're you're going through it. This is that's a tough diagnosis, without a doubt. Yeah, I have yeah, two I kids. Did. I can't. My biggest fear is one of my kids getting sick. I think about this constantly. Yeah, it's tough, and you know, Elizabeth, you're such a strong spirit. Um, she recently, uh, lost her home in the hurricane as well. So she means a lot to us. We've, we've all really rallied around her and Elizabeth, I'm just, I'm glad you came today and shared with us a little bit of your story. It will help someone who watches this. I'm sure of it. Oh yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, Brenda, you're up next. Hi, I'm Brenda. I'm from Tucson, Arizona. Um, about two years ago, right in the pandemic, I was diagnosed and had, um, a craniotomy for a left frontal lobe oligodendroglioma grade two. Mm -hmm. And I did six weeks of radiation in conjunction with chemotherapy and then six months of chemotherapy um, after that. Um, and last December, I started experiencing absent seizures. Um, and then I, they put me on Keppra and now they're stable. So I'm, I'm not having any seizures anymore. Um, my question is, I started having symptoms again, similar to the symptoms I had before, you know, my brain tumor. And so it scared me. So I immediately went to the doctor and they decided because I had some bowel incontinence along with it, um, they decided to do not just my brain, but my entire spine. And they found um, some degenerative issues, but not bad enough that it would explain anything. But then they also found um, a Tarlov cyst, but the doctors just kind of blew it off. And I was just wondering, is it because they don't understand it or is it just, you know, not a big deal or, you know, what, what is your experience with that? If any, I, I don't yeah. know. Um, well, you know, a few things. Number one, 
I mean, the a grade two glioma is a tough diagnosis as well. Um, and so, you know, it's it, I appreciate you kind of your, your sharing that. Um, Tarlov cysts are uh, benign lesions, basically. They're, they're kind of outgrowths of CSF. Um, and it is very, very rare that they cause symptoms. Now, again, I, without being able to see yours, I can't tell you. Um, there are reports in the literature of Tarlov cysts being of a size that they can compress things and cause symptoms, or usually it's more pain and numbness. But in general, um, we consider them to be completely benign. I'll, I'll tell you a, a little anecdote. I actually, um, one of my patients, there was a woman who uh, her grandfather um, was Tarloff. And we had this whole uh, kind of joke in the office where I was like, I was like, wow, well, I guess you didn't make any money because Tarloff, it's a benign disease. There's, you, you get your name on a disease that's completely benign. You don't get anything for it. <laughs> and um, And so... Um, but you no, know, not to make light of your of your issue. I think that it's important to have someone again multiple opinions on a tarlov cyst as well. The problem you have to be careful because at some point someone will offer you a surgery, and it's not necessarily the right thing to do. So you want to make sure that educated people are are looking at this, and not just people who are kind of you know looking to do a case. All right, um, but it also comes down to how how bad you're feeling from it, you know. And so you'll have to go through the full workup in general. I would be very, very hesitant to ever operate on a Tarlov cyst unless there was a clear, clear correlation with the symptom you were having. And it's very hard for me to imagine that, you know, the, the incontinence that you're suffering from is from this. But again, I, I can't see it. So it's hard for me to assess. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Good. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Brenda. Donna, you're up next. Hi, Dr. Amico. Um, I'm Donna. Um, I live in Raleigh, but I'm originally from Long Island. Um, and so um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. I had a craniotomy. I, I went to Duke University and um, I was told that um, it was no big deal. You know, I'd go in the day before, come out the next day after. And um, two weeks later, I was still in ICU. And I had suffered a stroke during surgery and I was left with right side paralysis. That I, I spent three weeks in a rehab center. And, you know, of course I learned to walk again, talk again, feed myself, all of that. And so now I'm doing very well. And um, so I've just started um, volunteering at a food bank and it's a lot of physical labor. And um, I'm able to do that because it's not using my brain at all. But um, I was just wondering, is this, you know, like, is, is there such a thing as too much? And like, what would, what would I need to look out for? Yeah. Like, can I well, overdo it? What, uh, what kind of tumor did you have? It was a grade two um, atypical. Meningioma. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's, those are tough, right? Because they can involve the blood vessels and the blood vessels of your brain are incredibly important, the veins and the arteries. And so, um, yeah, I'm sorry you had to go through that. Um, it's a, it's also, a I did not, I did not have radiation. I don't know if that's, you know, something that's typical or not. It depends on the extent of resection, how they felt that they did. Also in your case with a deficit for so long afterwards, they would want to avoid it at first. Okay. Um, they would probably slow play it. And so probably at the first sign of a recurrence, if you were to ever have one, not saying you will, just if you right. did, that would be kind of the time, you know, when, when you would think about that. Okay. Um, the, in terms of your actual question though. I tell patients to listen to their body, right? If you if your body will stop you, okay? There's a there's an old quote that Taylor's gonna make fun of me for because I've said it probably three times in the past week, but um, it was by Voltaire, I think, that you know the job of a, of a physician is to entertain the patient while nature heals, all right? Mm -hmm. And that's a, a little bit of an overstatement because you know you you needed surgery for your tumor, yeah. um, but. You know, your body will tell you when too much is too much, whether it's aches and pains or excessive sleepiness or just generally, you know, not feeling good. Um, so you, you just got to listen to your body. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Fair enough. Thank you, Donna. Lisa, you're up next. Okay. Hey there. This has just been fascinating. So thank you so <laughs> much. I've loved every moment of this. Um, I you. am just short of four years from a brain, brainstem uh, meningioma. Um, like Elizabeth, I had a lot of um, paralysis, vision issues, balance issues, swallowing, 
um, memory is not, not so great. Um, prior to that, I, in 2001, I had a uh, schwannoma on my spinal cord in the T9, T11 area. So through this process, I went through genetic testing and uh, wow. was positive for um, schwannomatosis. So my question to you is, is there a, a common thread or any a percentage of your patients that come to you that have been diagnosed previously with schwannomatosis and what impact does that have in longevity of the possibility of regrowth or, you know, um, and it was a grade one. Yeah. Was both. it an NF, is it an NF2 mutation or is it just schwannomatosis? They told you. They, they said it was just schwannomatosis. Okay. Because, so, so there, there are certain mutations um, that predispose people to developing these lesions, right? And they're actually, so NF2 is the primary one. It's, um, it's associated with meningiomas and schwannomas. Um, you know, do you have any others right now? They've, they've looked your whole body up and down. Yeah, that's kind of a, a catch-all right now because um, I've just went through a CT and they said that there was nothing that surfaced, but I can feel I have a large bulge on the right side of the uh, uh, upper right quadrant of my um, stomach. And, stomach. No, my stomach. Yeah. Hmm. And so, and it's, and it's getting bigger. It's, it's uh, definitely becoming more and more painful, but the thought process from the surgeon was that the uh, tumor was um, uh, rooted in what the ligament in the same area of uh, where this bulge is kind of stemming from, and that possibly there was uh, muscle weakness that is just I guess yeah. Worse, so worse, you know, so. Yeah, I you can know. get a hernia basically um, because the, the the tumor was on the right side in your spine. Yes, yes. Yeah, so you, it goes to the abdominal muscles and you can get uh, paralysis of those abdominal muscles um, and you can end up with an outpouching of kind okay. of, you know, just like a hernia somewhere else. And so if the imaging is negative um, and I'm assuming they've done an image for it, then it, that's almost certainly what it is. Okay. Um, there's, you know, I don't, I don't think there's much in terms of treatment for that. You would have to talk to really a general surgeon. Um, yeah. and again, not a lot of places are going to have experience with this because you're taking, um, two extremely rare things. You're taking a genetic predisposition to tumors, a schwannoma and the, and the actual, um, you know, hernia. Um, and those are, you know, very, very rare things. And so I think it's worth talking to someone, especially if it's bothering you, but I would, I would not assume that there's a tumor there. Um, if the MRIs are negative or the CAT scans are negative, all right? Okay. Now, in general, do you need surveillance? Absolutely, all right? Um, are you at higher risk in the general population? Absolutely, okay? And so, um, you know, you just need to make sure you're following up with your docs. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, no, and they're then, always and, eager to get me in the tube. It, you know, <laughs> it's like... and the other thing I would say, though, is I don't know how much work you've done on it, but there are people out there who specialize in, um, in these mutations. And so it's not necessarily wrong to do a, a search, you know, based on what exactly your diagnosis is, find the doctors who are studying this and reach okay. out to them, you know, oh, because okay. maybe there are trials um, that you can be involved in. Maybe, you know, they can share your record. Maybe you can just talk to someone else. Um, there are centers. I, I, Lennox Hill is not one of them. We don't, we don't really fully specialize in this, but any patient that we get that does, we refer to kind of the major centers um, where these people would be. And so it okay. takes a little bit of homework. I don't know them off the top of my head. I'd have to do some digging. Okay. But Wonderful. it can be found. Okay. Now, do you find that there's any connection with the schwannomatosis with uh, an increase of cancer patients or no? Not usually. Meningioma schwannoma is a little bit different. But what happens is schwannomas very, very rarely can have malignant differentiation. They can become malignant. Um, and so you just, again, just have to be monitored. Okay. Okay. And, and we you. have to know better what your genetic, you know, predisposition is. I need to know what genes and whatnot. So. Okay. Perfect. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, next up, Janine. Um, hi, Dr. Dominguez. Nice to meet you. And thank you for a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, my name is Denine. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I had a golf ball size meningioma removed from my left frontal lobe in August of 2019. 
and um, I developed hydrocephalus. And as a result, um, I have a VP shunt that was inserted in March of 2021. Um, I had a defective valve replaced and uh, currently it, it appears to be working after multiple um, adjustments to it. Mm. Um, I recently had a synovial cyst removed from my spine. It was pressing on the spine and it part of my spine was encased in that. Um, it was removed and the surgery was successful. Um, but my question is, I know the recovery time is like three months to a year is what I've been told by my neurosurgeon. And I'm just curious what the chances are that a synovial cyst can grow back. I seem to have had multiple cysts in other areas. Uh, where was your cyst? Was it on a nerve or in the canal? It was between L3 and L5. And it was on the spine, but it was also putting pressure on my spine and it was larger than they had anticipated till they went inside. Um, actually, I just saw him this week and he, yeah. he was able to remove and resect everything. Did surgery but, make you better? Yes, a lot better. Good. I mean, I honestly, to be honest with you, it's, it's a very rare thing. You guys, you guys are really the, uh, you know, a grab bag of, uh, of special patients. Um, yes. <laughs> that's an, it's an exceptionally rare thing. And to have both, to have the, the, the meningium and the shunt, the shunt malfunctions and the synovial system. <laughs> Um, I mean, you guys, you guys should all Welcome play lottery. Welcome to our party, Dr. Diego. You, you guys all need to play the lottery. And they, you they, wonder why we drink. <laughs> Where's the wine? Yeah, that's right. Incredible. Um, yeah, to be honest with you, I mean, look, you, again, you're going to have surveillance. You're going to know what your symptoms are, just like with your shunt. You're going to be more aware. You're going to be hyper vigilant. you know? And um, the rarity of needing a surgery for something like that is, is so, so rare. And so, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a question of, did you ever have a lumbar drain? Uh, yes, I had like, I had a lumbar drain. I had lumbar punctures. I had something where they put me in, ch um, check to see if I was a good candidate for the shunt. Yeah. Do you I think that the lumbar, did, it. <laughs> did he think that the cyst was due to the lumbar drain at any point? Well, I had a different neurosurgeon for the shunt. Like I yeah. went to Hopkins, so the one the one neurosurgeon does my shunt, and then my other neurosurgeon does the synovial cyst. And yeah. actually, I didn't. Now I maybe get why he seemed so surprised I was doing so good now because my legs are like at a hundred percent, my feet are much better, and um, my back is the main place where there's yeah. uh, pain. But so it's some so interesting, so uh, so interesting. Yeah, um, I don't know if it'll ever come back. I don't think so. If they did a good repair, it should be okay. But mm -hmm. as you have all proven, anything is possible. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> you guys are... Yeah, he, he actually did a fusion as well, so now yeah. I have some screws on my back. So yeah, okay, yeah. If it's something weird, I'll get it. <laughs> I'll tell you this. Uh, 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 I'm going to tell the you one this. One in though. a million. That's why yes, I'm wow. <laughs> the seven in a million. Um, yeah, listen, right. you, went, oh you went to a good place. Um, and, you know, the nice thing about academic centers, and I didn't mention this before, but it, it's actually really important, is um, your surgeon's not acting in a vacuum, right? There are checks and balances. And so when you come, when you come to see me, right, your case gets presented in front of a board. I don't do anything in isolation unless you're dying and I'm just saving your life. Um, you are presented in front of a group of radiologists, neurologists, other neurosurgeons. And in general, what you're getting is a consensus opinion, right? And so that's that's what makes academic places different. That's what makes the bigger centers different is you're getting someone who's talking to other people. And so I can't imagine, you, first of all, your case is so unique that I, I have to believe he spoke to other people because you know I would have. Um, and then number two, you got consensus probably. So just be wary, be vigilant. You guys all need to be very vigilant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. But, <laughs> 
Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. No problem. Listen, <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet y'all. Minutes or is ten o'clock or is one p.m. a hard stop for you? Uh, I can. We can go a little. We can go a little longer. It's okay. All right, we're almost around the room. I've got Pam left, and then I can oh, yeah. wrap it up for you. <laughs> we definitely got. We definitely got to finish everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Pam. I don't know where you went all of a sudden, but are you still I'm with here? Us? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm into another room. <clears throat> anyway, um, <clears throat> it's been three years since I've had my um, craniotomy partially resected because it's skull based. It was over three centimeters. Um, it was posterior to lower clivus, anterior to the medulla and lower pons. I still have over half the tumor left. I had it partially resected at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville with Dr. Kinonis, who spent probably about 12 hours in my head. And um, a week later, I developed hydrocephalus worse. So he had to go back in, put a shunt. Long story short, I was in the hospital in rehab from October of 19 till the following April. Feeding tube in my stomach because, draining into my stomach because of, um, like you were talking about the cranial nerves, um, paralysis of the left vocal cord, which I still have. I had to have eye muscle surgery due to double vision post-surgery. So I'm still in therapy. Um, the initial complaint that I had, which led me to the discovery of the meningioma, was very tight, stiff legs. They're worse now. I've had um, EMGs for neuropathy. I supposedly have no neuropathy. I am pre-diabetic. If there is such a thing, I'm on diabetic medication, metformin plus gabapentin, uh, 300 milligrams. Or I just started that about a month and a half ago. And baclofen. Nothing does anything. My question is, could my legs, as stiff as they feel, still be due to what's left of this meningioma. But I also have spinal stenosis. My lumbar, I don't know what I'm going to say, radiculopathy. My neck is a mess. I had a surgeon at UPMC said he wouldn't even touch my neck because of the meningioma there, get that taken care of first. Dr. Q said if I still had these symptoms after my surgery, it could possibly be from my neck. I mean, I, you talk about Deneen, I've been round and around the block too. And I'm, <laughs> I'm not young, I'm tired and I'm tired of thinking about it. I go to a physiatrist on Monday because after my surgery in Jacksonville. I'm from around Pittsburgh. And so far, I was hospitalized up here three times. I had aspiration pneumonia three times. I had to be a UPMC. So I had to get a neurosurgeon here mm -hmm. to care for me. So I actually talked to Dr. Q virtually and the other neurosurgeon recommended to go to a physiatrist and do therapy, or whatever. But Dr. D'Amico, nothing helps. Thank you for being here and for all your information. And I'm about, I don't know. I just, um, as you can see, I'm a bass. Uh, she's been in our peer Zoom groups for close to two years now. And the whole time, the stiff legs thing is like, your is really her biggest complaint yeah. of all of the things. And she's got many. Uh, is, I mean, there's just How nothing much, around uh, that. It's just like a permanent thing. Yeah. Well, Any it was there. Yeah. It was there before the surgery too, you said, right? Yes. Yeah. That's what yeah. led me, led yeah. me to the surgery. It's, it's, it's very I hard. Thought. It's very hard to comment on it without seeing what your scan looks like. Um, so I don't know where your tumor is. 
Uh, and I don't know. Well, I know where it is based on your description, but I don't know how much is left. And I don't know what your brainstem looks like. That's an extremely tight area. Um, I know Q very well. Um, he and I, yeah, we, we uh, co-host uh, a, a webinar called Tumor Talk um, that's dedicated for, for Latin American countries it's called LATTE, um, Latin American Tumor Talk and something earlier <laughs> with an E at the end. And um, he's a phenomenal guy. And I, you know, I think he's, he's a great surgeon. Um, and so it, I just, it'd be curious. I would need to see what it looks like. It sounds like your spine disease is real too. Um, and it sounds like your meningioma recovery is at a point where if the spine disease is worsening, you know, it's reasonable to consider taking care of it at this point, probably treated in a different way with a different incision. The problem with you is your medical comorbidities at this point, right? to go through another surgical procedure to intubate you, to do all these things, you know, there's risk. There's risk of further pneumonias of putting you back in a rehab for an extended period of time. And look, you're smiling too. And so a lot of times surgeons say it can be worse. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you have to understand that too. It, it can get worse. Um, and I think, uh, fortunately, all of you know this, um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a real concern. And, um, and so I think, you know, you have to get the films looked at. You need to, again, second opinions for everything. You need a good neurologist to think about what's going on with your spasm in your legs or the heaviness in your legs or the, the, the stiffness. Um, and you need to exhaust your medical management before you go back under a knife. Um, I got to tell you, you know, I, I gave a talk uh, to a podcast last week and they asked me why I do surgical neuro-oncology. And aside from the surgery part of things and aside from, you know, the medical part of things where I get to bridge the gap between, you know, molecular biology and surgery and all these things that I, I really enjoy and it's intellectually stimulating. I was talking about how the patient stories are the single most important thing um, because it gives perspective on life. Um, and, you know, a lot of a lot of the, the stories that I've heard today from you guys. And I again, I thank you for for sharing. Um, it's just a reminder, not just of, you know, my everyday life where I have two very healthy children right now. And, you know, I've, I've got a beautiful home and I'm, I'm very happy in my job, but it's a reminder about my job. Um, it's a reminder that there are people's lives, um, at stake. And once they walk out of that door, they still have to live a life. Right. And, you know, it's an important thing to understand from you guys, what, what the after kind of math of this whole process or continued process looks like. And so I wanted to thank you for that. That's, that's you know, tremendous for me. Um, it makes my day a whole lot better, to be honest with you. Um, so I was, yeah, so thank you. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're very much a safe place to fall. This group, uh, a lot of us, we, we have obstacles we're not even prepared for post a surgery like this. Uh, I'll end on a high note. I, I am very much a textbook recoverer. I live very well and didn't have a lot of issues with my craniotomy. However, I was pretty devastated when I was diagnosed over a decade ago in my early 30s uh, that I was going to need to kind of be on watch and wait and babysit this tumor. I had a car accident and ended up finding out I had a tumor afterwards thinking yeah. I was just going into assess a concussion. Um, but I'm going to be four years post craniotomy this December. I saw four neurosurgeons went to all the big spots, USC, UCLA, St. John's Medical Center, Cedars out here in Los Angeles. And uh, in the end, ended with Dr. Daniel Kelly. I really felt his bedside manner was matched what I needed. It was close to home and felt really good about it. And 99% of my tumor was removed. It was butted up against the main vein. That was why they took it out. So they kind of left some of the cells behind, but he's really confident that it won't be an issue in the future. Um, I had no symptoms going in and I had no deficits or symptoms post other than obviously anxiety for future MRIs and kind of monitoring this, just needing to learn about it and wrap my head around it literally. Yeah. Uh, it, it is life-changing even for someone who comes out really on a clean slate with it all. But my question to you is, if we can uh, kind of close with this, is what is the possibility of needing to worry about other conditions that might be related to this in my future? Are there things to look out for? Um, I know reoccurrence is possible, but are there other things that that maybe I'm at risk for, for having had this condition already? I don't, you know, not really. Um, recurrence is the biggest kind of thing that should, you know, and, and it's impossible to tell you you shouldn't be anxious about it. Um, because I know, like I said, benign disease, right? In question mm -hmm. marks. Um, 
the thing that I think should give you some comfort, maybe not totally, you know, calm your fears, but you're under surveillance. And so should it come back, you're going to know about it and you're going to have treatment options early. Um, and so you're never going to necessarily be in a place where you need another surgery unless it were to just continue to grow and grow and grow, you know? Um, and so other conditions associated with it, though, there's no, there's nothing really else. The genes that, unless you had an NF2 mutation, a genetic predisposition, which probably would have declared itself already, um, you know, there's not much else associated with it. I tell patients a lot because everyone wants to know, you know, I, I deal with a lot of gliomas and people are always like, well, how did this happen? Is it something I did? Is it something that, you know, I, I went through? The only association with meningioma, as I'm sure you guys have heard before, is radiation, you know, a history of radiation exposure. Um, and how much radiation, no one knows. And where that radiation was, no one knows. With gliomas, there's really nothing, you know? And so sometimes bad things happen to good people, right? Life is a bell curve and someone's got to be on the extreme ends of that bell curve. And, um, and you know, it, it kind of is what it is. And, and you, you dealt with it and you've all dealt with it and you're all kind of heroes for going through it. Um, but I would also, you know, you know, take note that there are people who understand a little bit of how devastating this is. Um, and I, I think Angel, you're a perfect representation of that. Doing this support group, you know, for the for everyone and, and opening it up. Uh it's a it's a unique forum. And I think you're doing an amazing job. Mm -hmm. But no, for you personally, I wouldn't be too worried about anything else than just your serial scans. And even then, I think, you know, we talked about grades before, you know your grade and, and whatever that is is should should guide you. Nice. Yeah, thank you. I'm currently on the 18 month plan. So uh you know, we always talk about how we kind of live with comfort within the windows of our next MRI scan because you feel good until you start to worry about, do I have more time? Um, this really is quite a journey and it doesn't stop uh, once our scar is healed over. And it really does begin when you get put on watch and wait and your panic starts because you think, oh my gosh, what is happening to me? So that's what this community is all about. Brain Tumor Companion is really here as a safe place to fall for people to vent, laugh, cry, celebrate the wins when they get those clear scans and have successful surgeries and uh, just support each other along the way. So um, I really thank you for being here with us today. It means so much for us to have your time and attention. Uh, and I really look forward to just following all that you do over there in New York, because we've all, all of us here have watched the, the Netflix show and we just really are inspired by the way you guys collaborate and put so much effort into quality care for your patients. Yeah. It means so much. No, thank you. Um, reach out anytime. Uh, you know, Angel can get in touch with me if you guys have more questions or anything. Um, I'm all over social media. I'll just leave it at that. You can Google yeah. and find stuff. <laughs> and do <laughs> send anyone in your world over there that might need our support and could use a place like this to, to no, I think go through all the feels. We're here for them. <laughs> I think it's very important. And um, and yeah, we we're you know we have a big uh, group of patients, and so we have a, a list of people and support groups and whatnot. So you're you're definitely on there. And and thank you all for sharing again. It's a privilege to be here. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great Thank day. You. Happy Take care. Day. Happy Thank weekend, you. everyone. You Take too. Care. You too. Bye. Thank you.